So we're going to start this reflection called The Spiritually Disabled. <laughs> They're talking about us. <laughs> so we're going to ask the Holy Spirit for His Word. And I'm reading to you from Colossians 4.2. And it says, Further instruction. Be steadfast in prayer and even spend the night praying and giving thanks. Pray especially for us and our preaching. May the Lord open a door for us that we may announce the mystery of Christ. Because of this I am in chains. Pray then that I may be able to reveal this mystery as I should. Deal wisely with those who do not belong to the church. Take advantage of every opportunity. Let your conversation be pleasing with a touch of wit. Know how to speak to everyone in the best way. <coughs> Tychicus will give news of me. He is our dear brother and for me a faithful assistant and fellow worker for the Lord. I am purposely sending him to give you news of me and to encourage you. With him I am sending <coughs> Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother, who is one of yours. They will tell you about everything that is happening here. So, <coughs> I know the, the title of this talk uh, sounds a little a little offensive in a way <laughs> because we don't want to hear the word disabled especially when we speak about spirituality right then what happens in this case I would think that uh, a person that is very materialistic a person that is so much of the flesh obviously is uh, actually practically crippled spiritually because you are non-spiritual so imagine we are not able to get away not being a spiritual, be a spiritual people because we have a soul and the soul can only be fed from the spirit. The soul will not be fed from the flesh. So you, how could you feed the, the soul from the flesh? The, the flesh does affect the soul. It does. Because you somatize some of the things that you uh, experience in the flesh and affect your soul. Because the, the soul is an anima, or that means animates the body. That's what God blows into the clay, that life, that is a, it becomes a soul. But that soul, in our case, is in the spirit of God. Because there are souls that are in the spirit of evil. Because there are only two spirits. So when they, when they speak of body, soul, and spirit, then the question is whose spirit? I mean, whose spirit is that? So there's only two spirits, the spirit of God or the spirit of evil. So we are talking about our soul and the spirit of God. So if we are spiritual, obviously we have the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit in us. So when a person is of the flesh and is only a materialistic person, a person that is so in the, on earthly bound, that has no contact with the spirit, actually becomes like a disabled person, a spiritually disabled. Meaning, being disabled spiritually means you have no love, you don't have the love of God. You only have human love. And I, I, I give you a comparison. A, a dog will be wagging his tail according to what he's gonna get, right? Mm -hmm. He's gonna get attention or a piece of something, the tail is going like this. <laughs> 
And if the dog is not getting anything, the tail is stiff, right? <laughs> and probably the dog is not even walking, it's laying down. So there's nothing happening, see? So basically, a human being that doesn't have any spiritual life is like a dog. See, their tails are only going to wake if they're going to get something. And that is exactly what a human being that is materialistic, that is 100% of the flesh, that's the only way that person acts. It's happy when things are working, miserable when things are not working, and it's just like an animal. See, it's those, even though it's able to reason, it's still the reason is, is subjected and slave to the flesh. So that, that reason is only made sense saying, I think I'm going to get something out of this if I stay quiet and hang long enough around here, around this table, and they're going to end up throwing something at me. So you hang in there. So that's the way you use your reason. So you are above a dog, but it's still acting like a dog. There's no much difference. Because you are after you want, after you appetize and desire, is that's all what you do. Just like an animal. You know, sometimes you think a dog is so well behaved, because it's, it's sitting there by the dining table, not making any moves. But you know that dog, the only thing that dog has here is, I want something on that table. <laughs> he knows that he cannot make a move, because he's going to slap. So he's there. So this is, this is what happens with people that are so much of the flesh. They are so domesticated, you know, because they're smart. They say, I cannot show them my want. But, oh, do I want? See? And this is, this is what happens, they are spiritually disabled. So what happened in this case in our daily life? St. John says, make sure you know whose spirit speaks through that person. Meaning, we really have to be aware of, of what kind of spirit is a person carrying. To start with, we know that a person that is living in mortal sin is obviously carrying the spirit of the devil. Regardless of how close that person is to us, and it could be your husband, your wife, your children, your friends, uh, people that work with you, it doesn't matter. They, if you are in mortal sin, living in mortal sin, you don't have the spirit of God. See, and so that sounds really, you know, today, the way the gospel is preached in the church, and the way people present the case of the church, the, it, the, it is so timid that people don't dare to say that. See, they don't dare to say, oh, if you are in mortal sin, you are not carrying the Holy Spirit. They are afraid to say that. Say, How horrible! That means I'm, I'm, demoni I'm a demonia, right? Like a, I am possessed. So, are you trying to tell me that? This is the way people respond. Though they are living in mortal sin. But the fact is, they actually are. See, if, if you live in mortal sin, the Spirit of God is not dwelling in you. Obviously, I mean, how could, it, how could the Holy Spirit live in, in a heart that doesn't belong to Him? God will never impose Himself on anybody. If you decide to stop the friendship with God, that's it. The Holy Spirit is not in your heart at all. So mortal sin does it. Mortal sin does it. That's why it's called a, a, a sin that is separating you from God, right? So now, when God created us and chose us for salvation in Jesus Christ and gave us the Holy Spirit, He, he gave us a spirit of strength, a spirit of love, a spirit of wisdom, and a spirit that is going to lead us and tell us what to do, where to go, when to do it, and even to guide us in the way we feel about our lives, the way we sense our lives, because He will take our senses and instinct, the way we instinctively live our life, is also guided by the Holy Spirit, which is no longer that dog, it's no longer that. Because if the Holy Spirit is in our senses and instincts, then we are not uh, surviving uh, out of the elements of nature. We are surviving out of God in the elements of nature, which is different. We, we live to live, uh, we eat to live, but we don't live to eat. See, a, a person that is of the flesh lives to eat. And a person that is of the spirit eat to live. No, it's, it's different. It's, the, it's a very different type of person. And then you are not going uh, after your instincts and senses uh, in, a, in a just plain natural way, because that will be your animal. 
but you are going about your instincts and senses in a spiritual way, which is the spirit in you that is guiding you to do what you have to do within the elements of nature. So you are in a supernatural state, though you are dealing with nat nature. And, and this is so important to have it clear because you have to really look at your life and find out how much is the Holy Spirit actually uh, working within you in the, in the fullness of it, in, in your instincts, senses, and your reason, how much is the Holy Spirit actually doing everything in you. Because the, the, the more you understand this, the more you're going to discern the Spirit that really moves you. You notice that uh, sometimes we have an impulse and, uh, and we want to act upon that. But there's something telling us, wait a minute, this is not a good impulse. Sometimes we have an impulse to do something wrong and to commit a sin. And we obviously know it's not good. But the, the moment you begin to really examine yourself and to be really courageous as to how much the Holy Spirit is acting in your life, then you're going to gain the strength to stop those impulses that lead you to sin. See, not, not necessarily always will be to stop temptation, but to stop impulses, because not all the time you commit a sin because you were tempted. See, people think that you only sin when you are tempted. And it's not true, because the devil is not always tempting you. Sometimes you yourself commit a sin on your own. See, how many times have you decided to do something wrong on your own? Not because there was a voice going, get it, go, go forward. This, there was nothing, it was you. You got up and say, hey, I think I feel like uh, doing this. And this, you go and do it. There was no spirit involved in that. It was you. You did it. Now, <clears throat> the devil is very prompt. The devil is very fast at jumping on opportunities. If you, if you lead yourself into sin, he's going to associate with you very fast. Because as soon as you commit a sin, he's there. Because you belong to him, you're in his territory. And he becomes an aid. He, he is, it's like they say, uh, look for the things that are above and everything else will be added unto you. See, that's what the word says. So on the opposite side is, do the things that are below and everything evil is going to be added unto you. <laughs> right? So that is exactly what it is. You, you go and commit a sin on your own, voluntarily, and everything bad is going to be added unto you. So the devil is going to come and strengthen your sin and make sure that sin becomes very stable in your life. Establish it itself as a permanent uh, reality. And that's why a lot of people are not able to, to shake it off. You notice people that are living sometimes in common law and they come to church. Oh, they are so punctual. They are the first one. You know, they are always there 30 minutes before the Mass and they stay 30 minutes after the Mass. And they will do incredible jobs in the church and they will be so charitable and do that and live in mortal sin. See, and you wonder, wait a minute, there's something wrong with this picture. See, how could you? And you notice today, all the talk in the church about the couples that cannot go to communion and all of that. And, and I tell you this, I feel for them because they are people of God, children of God, and there is a reason why they are living like that. You cannot judge them, you know. It could be any one of us. It could be me, it could be you. It doesn't matter, you know. We are just human beings and circumstances in our life will place us in situations where we probably end up doing that. And, and okay, that's fine. But the question is this. As long as you are aware that what you're doing is not with God and it's not exactly of God and it's not a friendship with God, then it's okay. Because then you have to be aware of, the, of who you are, what you're doing with your life, and what you're dealing with. But if you enter in self-denial and think that in spite of you living in mortal sin, you feel as if you're not, then you are in trouble. Because then the devil is going to get you. Because the devil is going to go before God and go, you see, he knows, he knows, she knows, but they don't care. You know, they, they're just living as if they, they, uh, they are okay, they are fine. So this is a territory for Satan. Because he can do things to you. He will have the power. I, I, um, I wrote a book on purgatory. And uh, among the things, I, this book was just translated into English and it's being corrected now, proofread, so I can print it in English. 
And this book, I collected a lot of testimonies from saints that had experiences of purgatory. One of them is a testimony of St. Bridget of Sweden, and this you can pick up on the internet anytime, this is what I'm going to tell you. It's a, it's a testimony of St. Bridget of Sweden that witnessed a trial before the throne of Jesus. And it's a, a, a trial of a man that is going to die soon. But the devil is in front of the throne of Jesus asking for the soul. Say, it's mine, because look what this soul is done. And it presents the whole case of this person. And, it, and it's incredible how the devil is getting at uh, this guy, trying to pick him up. And then all, all the demons, when the devil is losing the case, all, lots of demons show up to scream and tell you are a mighty God. You're merciful. You are giving and loving. And they praise God in incredible ways. And they say, and you condemn us, you throw us our grace uh, because we did this and that. And this guy did the same. So he belongs to us. Just like that, you know. Fighting really hard. At, at the end, our lady is the one that rescues the soul. And the guardian angel was the one that was the, the attorney before the body step there, before the court. <clears throat> and uh, what I'm trying to say with that is, if we are not aware of the enemy we have, then... We will be spiritually disabled because we are not aware of the battle we have as far as <clears throat> how we're dealing with sin. See, if we give an opportunity to the devil where the Lord has shown us a sin and has shown us that we are wrong, but still we keep on going in that direction, then he has power. Then he has power because he shows up before the Lord and says, look, that person already knows, he's been aware of, it's been told, it's been shown, and look, the person is still going. So, they like it, see, it's mine, it's mine. So, God will not do anything about it, will just let you in the territory you chose. See, because you have the freedom, you have free will. So, God is not going to do anything else but tell the devil, well, it's in your territory, that's all you can do. I'm talking about a person that is not going to die soon <laughs> because in the case I explained to you before it was a person that was going to die soon so his soul was already uh, before a trial and, and then mercy came up through Our Lady and intercessions of relatives and all the, the soul's economy it showed up and then the final result was that person was rescued and was placed in a very low state of purgatory but attained salvation so, the important part to realize here is whose spirit is speaking to us. That's very important. See, when you are relating, you are in a relationship with people, which we are every day, even if we don't get in personal basis one-to-one -one with people, even if we live in the countryside alone, we are related to people because people are existing around us and whether we speak to them or not, we belong together. We are part of a family, human family. Even if they don't believe what you believe, it doesn't matter. We are related to people all the time. It's like, it's, it's like we are related to oxygen, to the air. We are related to it. If we, if we wouldn't have it, we wouldn't leave. So we are related to people because people are cells of a body that is called a human family. And whether you like it or not, we belong to one body. See, if we do, it's not all the body it, it becomes mystical, not all the body, the human body. Not all the human body becomes a mystical body. See, out of this body, out of this clay of the human family, there comes a, a mystical body, which is the body that becomes a, of the spirit. See, from this clay, this body of clay of all of humanity that belongs together because we come to the same flesh, from the same... Uh, the forefathers from this body, we are invited by the Spirit of God to become of God. So, everyone that from this body of clay goes into the Spirit becomes part of the mystical body that is the mystical body of Jesus. That's why St. Paul says that he, in his body, is completing the suffering that are lacking to be completed in, in, the, in the mystical body of the Lord. And that's what each one of us do. See, when you are uh, existing within God by living your life according to the will of God, which is to just acknowledge your life as 
something good. See, regardless if you're going through a lot of difficulties in your life, and <coughs> sufferings of all kinds, and confusion, and so many things that are not right, and still you are, you are kind to yourself and to God and to people because you take it just as it is, even if you don't understand, like like you were saying in the past talk, even if you don't get it, doesn't matter. You go along with it, you exist within it, you carry the cross, you suffer along with it, and then at that moment, what you are is you are completing the suffering of Christ in the mystical body. That means you are part of the mystical body. So first we have the body of humanity, which is clay, really. And then uh, the body, the part of the body that becomes mystical because embraces the love of God becomes the body of Jesus, the mystical body of the Lord. When that body will be completed, which is a mystery how it works, is formed by cells and those cells are the souls that embrace the grace of God. So one day, that body will be completed. Only God will know. That's why they say, the end, only the Father knows. Because the Father is the only one that can see when the body was completed. And it's completed by us, by each one of us. So that day, the economy of salvation will be over. Procreation will finish. And, and the whole plan of God is completed. So death will go away, no longer exist. And uh, all of this will come to pass. And new heavens and new earth will land, the city of Jerusalem. And this is over. That's the end. But before that, we are building, we are in a construction of the mystical body of the Lord. So when someone is not of the Spirit, is obviously disabled spiritually, and is not part of the mystical body. So that person is as good as an animal, sometimes worse than an animal, because animals sometimes are better than human beings that are non-spiritual. Believe me, human beings are able to do horrible things that animals will not do. Animals will not do. I was, I was just seeing something horrible. I'm always checking the uh, work of the devil, you know, how he's doing and how deep are we getting into the abyss. You know, the deeper, we get, the deeper humanity reaches down, the most horrible demons become active on earth. And you can see by the levels of crime and the levels of horrible things people are doing, how deep are we getting down? How deep are we digging? Because the deeper in the abyss, the more horrible the demons. So today we have demons on earth that we never had before. See, they were thrown down here, but they are in a state, so a state of condemnation, eternal fire. So they are not active into our realm unless we pull them out. And we pull them out through sin. So sin begins to dive down, begins to dive into the abyss depending on the levels of sin. So all of humanity creates a body of sin as a whole. And then begins to dip down, to go down deep, and then begins to... The, deep, the, 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 the deeper you dig down, you become a ladder and they climb through you because they need your flesh to climb. They cannot climb on their own. They come through you. So they come up and become active among us. They become active among us. A few days ago, uh, they discovered that two girls, one was 17, the other was 15. They were torturing an, an autistic boy, right? And getting the boy to have sex with animals and beating the boy. Two girls, 15 and 17, and they were videotaping the boy and publishing everything they were doing to him. That was somewhere in the U.S. So I, I can tell you, so these are a 15-year-old, a 17-year-old playing with, an, with a boy, you know, that it was autistic, and, and got him to do horrible things, torture him, all of that, and tape him. So that shows you where we are at. That shows you where we are at. So you see, human beings that are of the flesh, are animals are good. See, animals will even beasts. Of, of nature are not able to do that. They don't do that. See, they go for the prey, they go for it when they are hungry. They go and eat and live, but they don't stay there killing everybody. You know, because you see, even wild beasts will only kill for, to survive. They will kill, they get, they get full and they stop killing. They dare, they sleep, they probably just don't worry. They probably see all kinds of flesh go by that they could eat, but they don't eat it. 
because they are already satisfied, but human beings no. They will they keep on killing. See, they will be killing. They will they will be serial killers. See, they, that doesn't exist in nature in animals. It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist like a serial killer in animals. They only kill when they're hungry. The wild beast. So we become worse than animals. Much worse than animals. So. When we speak about spiritually disabled, we speak about people that are not of the spirit. And unfortunately, today, we have a massive amount of people that are spiritually disabled. And the reason is, there are millions of millions of children of fornication, and children of rape, children of horrible situations in life that are not of God. And that doesn't mean that those people are not of God. It means they were not created on the will of God. See, they came alive through a rape, through fornication, through, it was a miracle they were not aborted, just by accident they weren't aborted. And then what happened? All these people form a population of this world. And a lot of them are so empty of love <coughs> that they are prey of the devil and become horrifying instruments to do things you cannot even dream what they can do because they are empty vessels of the love of God. They were not conceived with the love of God. So therefore they are a prey for the devil. They pray. But also, some of those people become the greatest saints. See, we, we know, I know, I know people that are extremely, and I read the life of saints that were the product of rape, and, and, and the son of a prostitute, and, and they were gigantic saints. So that doesn't mean that if you were conceived in mortal sin by a, a woman that was fornicating in a, in a situation like that, that doesn't mean you are condemned because this, the, the Word of God says that you will not carry the sins of your parents unless you imitate them. See, if you imitate them, you carry them. But if you don't go along with what they did, you're safe because God is not going to judge you on the sins of your parents. So we, we have to understand that God is going to ask us to really be aware of the spirit that is acting through us. When we are, sp when we are holding a conversation with somebody and uh, different uh, areas of the conversation are coming up, you know, we're touching different areas, sometimes you feel some emotions come up and uh, sometimes you get heated, you know, a little bit, and the emotions change, and sometimes you project yourself with those emotions, and you know there's something wrong coming out of you, right? Anger, pride, and sometimes the strange uh, attitudes that we carry just because of the conversation we have. That's why it is so important for a, a, a Christian that is faithful to watch conversation. You, don't get involved in every conversation. Even if you are with your best friends and people that you trust, that doesn't mean you can get involved with any conversation. There are things you should not talk about it. There are things you should never touch because there are always the spirits jumping on your tongue. Always. You know, the, the most favorite instrument of your body for the devil is not necessarily your mind. It's your tongue. Because with the tongue, the devil comes and whips everybody. It's a whip, you know, it comes and whips with the tongue. So, if you, the fact that you are, it's like here we are in this retreat. And uh, I was just talking to Father Kid about this particular uh, spirituality of retreats. And we were discussing that sometimes they come to a silence retreat, for a week silence retreat. And I always wonder, I say, well, wait a minute. I mean, that sounds interesting, it's good. But for you to come in a weak spiritual retreat of silence, you have to be really well out there in the spirit. You have to be a person that is prepared to leave such an incredible height of the spirit. Because we live in a world out there that is packed with people that are godless, and that's the environment we live in, most of us, out there. So now, if you have a chance to come and share a week with people that speak the same spiritual language as, as you, but they keep you silent, and then when you are supposed to share your faith, you are silent, and then you are packed with the noises inside you. So what good does it do if you stay in a week of silence when your noise is so loud inside you that it doesn't make any difference that you're not speaking? 
See? So there are a lot of wrong ways of doing the retreats and they come with these sophisticated things. And some of them come from the mystics of the church, but they were meant for people that were already prepared to lead silence retreats. And I guarantee you something. Based on what I have seen traveling through the world in the Catholic Church, very, very few people are prepared to have a silent retreat. Very. But sometimes I go to a, a, a retreat center and there are 50 people there on a the silent retreat. And then you go and talk, talk to the people and there's somebody there that is not even converted. Someone that is like, I say, what are you doing in silence? You know, it's like, what? What is this? That, that is wrong. You know, it's all intellectual. It's like sophisticated type of retreats that are just playing with people because it's not good, you know? Even if a priest is doing it, even if they're using San Ignacio or Loyola uh, spiritual exercises, which are wonderful and great, but not everyone is ready to do this kind of retreats. So, and, and so what I'm trying to say is the spirit that speaks through us has to be clear. We have to understand who is dwelling in our heart. Who? Because if we are not clear about that, we might be just channelers. We are just airports for all kinds of spirits. And it changes. You know, spirits are, are completely uh, active around us. If we could see the spiritual world, we'd be in shock. Because we think there are a lot of people in the world, seven billion? Oh, think again. There are billions of billions of billions of billions of spirits here, here. Only they are in a different realm. Because you see, right here, we have the realm of the spirits that are in purgatory. Right here, we have the realm of the spirits that are in hell. And right here, we have the realm of the spirits that are in the glory of God. See? But I'm not talking about earth. I'm talking about realms. Realms. And then... Somehow, because this is creation, right? The creation of, of creation and spirits of God, all of us, whether they are demons, angels of God, or us that are here, or souls in purgatory, we are all one body created by God, all of us. Then those dimensions, those realms, they interchange. The only one that is totally, eternally separated is hell totally separated. But as far as earthly life, purgatory life, and heaven is constantly moving along together. See? It's constantly together. That's why it's called the three churches. And, and it's constantly so. Sometimes we cross into those realms and, and, and get involved with them. And we don't even notice that. But at the same time, though the realm of hell is separated from us, Still, those spirits mingle around because they are roaming around us, roaming in their realm. But what they do is they need a physical instrument to act in our realm. So if we open a door to their spirituality, which is evil, they enter through that door because it is their realm. The realm is evil. It's like a I always give the example of the caca rose that comes into the kitchen, right, and, and looks, for, yeah. looks for crumbs and dirt and things. So if they don't see anything in the kitchen, they just find it too boring and they leave, right? There's nothing there for them. But if they come in and see something, shoom, they jump, and the next thing you know, you have 10 caca roaches out of nowhere, right? <laughs> and because there's dirt there. And that's what happens with the spirit, the spiritual realm, it's exactly the same, you know, they, if they, they are there in their realm, but if they see something that is related, belongs to them, it's them, you know, it's dirt. They go, whoop, and they come in there. So a lot of people are channeling the spirits all the time, because they, they don't have a clean heart. They are dealing with things that are not of the light, and therefore the spirits are coming in and out, in and out, in and out. And it's not the same spirit all the time. It's always different, because you're moving along, you're changing, you're acting during the day, you're moving from one place to another. Even when you sleep, they are at work with you. Even when you sleep, because they prepare you for the next day. See, you probably notice this. Some people go to bed, but before they go to bed, they watch the news for an hour, two hours. Some people are so sick, they are watching for three hours, right? I don't know, it, it might be so, right? It's true. 
And then imagine all the dirt that you pick up on the news. I mean, it's so horrible. News are so horrible. You pick up all kinds of dirt. And then they don't even say the Hail Mary and go to bed. See, all this dirt that you picked up is going to work on you all night. The next day you wake up and not tell you what you're going to wake up with. Because they use everything that you assimilated, everything you let in, they're going to use it. And they're going to, they're going to play a video. They are great editors. Oh, the demons are the best editors. I wish we would learn so much about editing videos like the demons, you know. They pick up this scene from this type of thing from here, from there. Things that happen in your heart during the day and they make a movie out of that, see? And, you, and they give it to you in a plate while you're sleeping. And you, how many times have you woken up and you knew you were in a big movie and you cannot pick up any from that movie? You, you just came off the movie, mm -hmm. but the movie was on all the time when you were sleeping, right? You just cannot pick it up again in your memory, in your natural memory. But it was on all night, right? Well, believe me, that movie was working in you, was working in you, and it changed things in you, and it made you, it made you something, it did something in you, and the next day you're going to be part of that movie, and everything you're going to do. You're going to be acting upon that movie, because you're part of it already, it happened in you. So, if we don't pay attention, I was talking about, do not start just every conversation, we don't have to do that. So why talk about things you're not supposed to talk about it? That is the opportunity you open for spirits to land and leave you, and you can do things wrong just by speaking about those things. There are things we should not touch. There are things we should not speak about it. Period, you know? Same thing. There are things we should not do that will invade our mind, our senses, instincts, our being, and then we go to bed with it. It's not good. Because then demons are going to edit all of that and create a specific movie for your life. And you're going to be feeding from that without knowing. A lot of people, because of the world we live in, that is a consumism that is so incredibly stream, um, television is focused on selling you stuff. They sell you bad news, they sell you negativity, they sell you economy levels of different ways. They sell you politics, they sell you so many things, sexuality, all kinds of things. So what happens? Um, you, you don't even notice, but you buy that. You begin to buy that. And you begin to accept it. So the next thing you know, you wake up the next day, and you have a lot of needs created. Because in the movie that they edited for you, they created a need for you. Some want. And it's just so definite in your heart that you believe, that you want it, that you need it, that is something important for you. And it's, it was sold to you. And, and, and you got it. See, it's in you. So imagine all the things we have to fight with if you don't pay attention. That's why to be a spiritually healthy and not to be a spiritually disabled, we have to watch the intake of everything. We have to watch what we hear, what we, what we see, when we talk about it, we have to watch our feelings and emotions. We have to be guardians of our lives. Guardians. Very, very zealous guardians of our life. Don't open up into everything. You don't have to listen to everything. You don't have to watch everything. You don't have to talk about everything. Just watch. Because it's not about that. It's about being cautious, prudent, decent. It's about being very coherent with your faith and understanding how important it is to build this sophisticated and strict discipline of spirituality. Where it is to make sure it is the Spirit of God who speaks to you. It is the Spirit of God that is dealing with your instincts, senses, with your reason, that is dealing with your emotions, that is dealing with your impulses, that is dealing with the beat of your heart. That is so important to determine. So, so that you know that you are really palpitating within the heart of the Lord. Palpitating. You are there in the same heartbeat of Jesus. Same heartbeat of Jesus. I have a music ministry in my community, in, in the Mother House in Bogota. And a few days ago, I had a meeting with them. 
and they are all young, only two are adults, but most of them are probably tops 21, 22 from 15 on. So we have a choir of singers and we have violin players and cello and pianists and things like that. We, we, uh, we uh, promote sacred music for adoration and we try to bring back the classical sacred music of the church and that's what we do. And uh, I was talking to them and telling, giving them a reflection about the music and the ministry and I was saying, listen, notes don't fight with each other. See, they play together, musical notes. So you as instrument have to become like the notes. You cannot fight with each other because then you're not going to become good instruments. Because then how can you portray the notes that don't fight with each other with instruments that are fighting against another? So all this spirit of competition and all these things that you're doing is keeping you from letting the notes be as free as they are naturally. So this is type of the kind of the reflection I was giving them. Because they are, you know, they, they, they have a, a spirit of competition among them and all jealousy and all, all of these manipulations they have. And it creates a lot of problems. So it's natural, it's human. But this is the type of guy, spiritual guidance you need to give to people in order to understand what we are looking for. We are looking for to be those notes that don't fight with each other. The, the, the musical notes that are really in harmony that will bring the right melody, the right sound, the right music. Because you see, he notes in hell are notes fighting with each other. See, demons don't get along. Demons don't get along. You notice that thieves, thieves steal among themselves, they steal from each other. They go and rob a bank, and then they rob each other. <laughs> That's thieves. And that is demons. Demons are like that. So we are the opposite. We belong to harmony. We belong to notes that don't fight with each other. And that's why we have a melody that is called celestial melody. It's the melody of the love of God. And that's what we have to focus on. So the Lord wants us to understand that spiritual health, real spirituality, is understanding that the Spirit of God has to lead the pack. The Spirit of God is the one that has to be in us in every aspect of our lives. Obviously, we are going to be in and out of it because this is the fight we have. We have to fight with this. St. Paul explains it beautifully because he says that it seems as if the flesh is constantly fighting with the Spirit. The flesh tends to what is seen and what is of the flesh and the spirit to what is grace and what is of God. And obviously the two of them being one person, the same person, is tending to a different direction. So that's why Jesus comes as the one that brings peace between the two. So Jesus becomes the bridge that brings peace between the flesh and the spirit. So if we don't bring the spirit of Jesus in between the flesh and the soul, then they will never reach the spirit of God. Obviously, the only way is to bring the Spirit of God in between the flesh and the soul, so that the Spirit will be the Spirit of God. So the soul that animates this body has to be uh, embraced by the Spirit of God only. And the Spirit of evil is going to come in any time you open up to all these vices, all these sins. Any sin, the Spirit of evil will come in and take over, because the true Spirit will not be able to dwell in one heart. It's either or. They, they, take, they take everything, both of them. God will not come into a divided heart. And so is the devil. The devil would not do that either. The devil takes it all too. He's a thief. He comes in and storms in and stays there and takes everything out that is not of God, that is not of him. So today we have an opportunity, a big opportunity in our life to really look in and find out how much activity we really have focused consciously into bringing the Spirit of God to everything in our life, everything in our being, because it's not that difficult. We think this is a lot of work and we think, oh, how could I ever get to understand this? This is so deep, so complicated. It's not true. It's not deep, it's not complicated. It's very simple. See, everything of the Spirit is basic. So basic that we not, don't get it because it's too simple. Mm -hmm. And we are too sophisticated, too intelligent. We know too much. So to become so little and so, so detailed about little things is not easy for us. And so, but God wants us to understand 
that it is possible. It's possible just, just become little, small, quiet, sit there and relax and just let it be and be, listen to the Lord that is in you. He speaks to you all the time. The voice is a dim voice because God is not screaming. You know, he said it's a love voice and the love voice is always soft. It's so tender, it's so beautiful and kind. And that's why we ignore it so many times. Because we learn just to obey voices that are commanding us with loud noises, you know, because the world is loud. <clears throat> and people that are <coughs> guiding people in this world are so arrogant, so proudful, and they are loud, very loud. And that's why they influence people and, and, and take people with them. Because they have this, this loudness to them. God is not like that. God is not loud. A lot of people are expecting signs from heaven, so they want trumpets to blast and all kinds of signs in order for them to believe. You know, when you invite people to go to places that are holy, places, shrines of Our Lady, the Holy Land, and I don't know how many places, Rome, there are so many holy places that we can go to, to feed spiritually. A lot of people think that going there is because I'm going there to see something, see extraordinary. And that's the big mistake you make because it's not about that. It's about going to a place where a lot of people pray, where a lot of people feel the presence of God because they go there to do that. And then you share the spots that God chooses for you to be fed spiritually. This is one, for example. This place is like 200 years here of prayers, of retreats, of monks coming in and out of here and dying. The cemetery here is full with the bodies of, of, of friars, you know, that, that went through this, give their lives to God. Some of them were holy, some of them were not, but still they went through this. And these are spots that God chose for the souls to be fed. And, and so it's not about signs. That's what Jesus said. See, the Jews are looking for signs and the Greeks are looking for wisdom. But we are looking for Christ, a crucified Christ. Now, today, if we look at that clearly, we understand that our life is not a life lived after signs. It's not a life lived after God proving to us that God is real. <clears throat> because that is not supposed to be our life. People wander around, I wish I could get a sign. I wish, I wish God would tell me how, what to do. I wish I would. And this is such a big mistake. Because you have to become smaller than that. Smaller than that. You have to just be the person that wakes up and live with what you got. That's all you do. Don't expect anything else. Just live with what you got. Even when things are terrifyingly difficult and horrible in your life, that's when you even get smaller than ever. Because then if you make any move, you may blow it. You may make it worse than it is. So just wake up and just stay there. Hold your ground on, on what you have. And don't make any extraordinary moves. And don't fill your heart with anything extraordinary. Be small. Be little. And the Lord will lead you through. Will get you out of it. Will walk you through. So somehow. And this is the way we should do. That, that's the only way we, can have, we could have a spiritual health. Otherwise, we will be spiritually disabled. So I'm going to conclude with a reading. And I'm talking about, I'm reading from Mark 10.1. Divorce. Jesus then left that place and went to the province of Judea, beyond the Jordan River. Once more crowds gathered around him, and once more he talked them, as he always did. Some Pharisees came and put him to the test with this question. Is it right for a husband to divorce his wife? He replied, What law did Moses give you? They answered, Moses allowed us to write a certificate of dismissal in order to divorce. Then Jesus said to them, Moses wrote this law for you because you are stubborn. But in the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. And because of this, man has to leave father and mother and be joined to his wife. And the two <coughs> shall become one body. So they are no longer two, but one body. Therefore, let no one separate what God has joined. When they were indoors at home, 
The disciples again asked him about this, and he told them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against his wife, and the woman who divorces her husband and marries another also commits adultery. The word of the Lord. So we praise the Lord and we thank you.